chapter 20, Paul's epistles divided in overview, divisions within Paul's epistles. Before delving deeper into the specific of Paul's epistles, one must understand that the Apostle Paul's ministry included some obviously identifiable transitions. As a starting point for a more complete understanding, the Bible student must find and recognize these significant demarcations. It is important to note that although the Bible was written within a span of time, God did not choose to organize the canon of Scripture to reflect a strict chronological order. While this lack of a sequential progression may seem puzzling to some, the diligent student can ascertain the order of the epistles and their primary objectives. God placed sufficient information within the text of Scripture to enable the Bible student to understand what God wants him to know. Yet the student must show himself a studious workman in order to learn the truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Simply put, God does not reward lazy Bible study. In order to help facilitate an understanding of the transitions within Paul's 14 epistles, these epistles are divided into three primary sections based upon timing and chronology. Number one, Paul's missionary epistles. Number two, Paul's prison epistles. And number three, Paul's final epistles. The following chart reflects two of these three divisions within Paul's epistles. Every astute Bible student should notice some overlap and common characteristics between the divisions, but the purpose for the layout of the divisions should become self-explanatory as one's study continues. An example of the overlap, Paul was not only in bonds during his prison epistles, but remained bound as God instructed him to pen the epistles to the pastors, Timothy and Titus, and the epistle to the Hebrews. The chart on page 302 is titled Paul's Missionary and Prison Epistles. Paul's Missionary Epistles. The book of Acts, beginning in Acts chapter 13 through his imprisonment in Acts chapter 28, records Paul's three missionary journeys. His final trip ending in Rome is not generally considered to be his fourth missionary journey since he was not free but in bonds on his way to a prison in Rome. The first group of books, Romans through Galatians, plus First and Second Thessalonians, is referred to as Paul's missionary epistles because they contain some doctrinal applications peculiarly associated to the period covered by those missionary journeys. In some cases, the application of particular doctrines during this time significantly differs from the doctrines applicable in Paul's later ministry, which continue into today. Therefore, some of the truths prevalent during Paul's earliest days have transitioned into obscurity before the conclusion of the first century, before A.D. 100. Those who approach the Bible with a sincere desire to discover truth will recognize the particular timing and foundational nature of these earliest epistles. For instance, this section contains Paul's earliest teachings and admonitions concerning the sign gifts, which will be explored in greater detail later. These early epistles lay the groundwork for important doctrines such as salvation, proper fellowship, rejection of false doctrines, and the church's departure at the blessed hope. Unfortunately, some groups have rejected many of Paul's earliest teachings, thinking that they do not reconcile with Paul's later teachings. Additionally, in these last days, the confusion faced at the beginning of the church age once again plagues the church today. For instance, Paul's earliest epistles of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were intended to refute errors being taught concerning Christ's return for the church before Daniel's 70th week. Footnote number one. See Revive in the Blessed Hope for a commentary on the prophetic elements of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. The forthcoming chapters explore the significance of the transitions. Transitions including the gospel presentation to the Jew first. The forthcoming chapters explore the significance of the transitions. Transitions including the gospel presentation to the Jew first. Speaking in tongues. Supernatural visible signs. And abstinence from certain meats forbidden under the law. Note, this transition in no way applies to baptism and the Lord's Supper as some have erroneously taught. When teachers apply these Bible study methods to these two ordinances, they might as well apply it to the doctrine of salvation clearly delineated in the book of Romans too. Simply put, 
God never intended, as some have erroneously concluded, that we should eliminate application of much of Paul's first four books to the church age. Beware, hyperdispensationalism finds its roots in overapplication of this truth to matters outside of God's intended scope. Paul's prison epistles. The second grouping within Paul's epistles consists of his letters to Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and a man named Philemon. This section is appropriately identified as prison epistles because of their similar content and conditions, Paul's imprisonment. In this section, one finds much of the bedrock material for living a consistent Christian life. In these epistles, we learn the great treasure that we have in Christ and find the admonition to walk accordingly. Paul's final epistles. Prior to Paul's departure to be with Christ, he had some unfinished work in the area of writing. Among this unfinished work, Paul dictated three epistles to his beloved sons in the faith and made a final attempt to reach the Jews, his kinsmen according to the flesh. The differences in content are truly revealing and beautiful when one considers the divisions set forth in the epistles. We are to rightly divide the word of truth even within Paul's epistles. Some of the initial unusual features of Paul's ministry, instituted for specific purposes, were phased out by God by the time Paul went into prison in Acts chapter 28. Without a thorough understanding of this truth and its various applications, it becomes impossible for the Christian to be approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. Even the book of Galatians seems to transition Paul's ministry from missionary to prison as he pointed out the dangers and corrected the errors of Christians trying to usurp the peculiarity of living as a Jew. The next chart is divided down the middle. The use of a dotted line signifies that a division falls in a major period that must be considered individually as well as collectively. The dividing point has AD 100 denoted at the bottom. This date signifies a point in time when all Bible scholars agree that the 66 books of the Bible were already in completed form. The chart on page 304 is titled Paul's Epistles Divided. The date AD 100 does not signify when the actual books listed were written, nor does it represent the date of Paul's imprisonment. The AD 100 date simply signifies that God's word was perfected or completed by this time in history. The importance and necessity of dividing Paul's epistles should be quite evident as we continue our study. A thorough understanding of this division is necessary in order to comprehend other issues covered in later chapters. However, a warning bears repeating at this point. While we must recognize the division between Paul's missionary epistles, prison epistles, and his final epistles, we must not apply this Bible study tool beyond God's intended purpose. Excessive application of this Pauline division causes as much error and harm as does the failure to apply it at all. Some groups take this division to an extreme by eliminating most of the application of Paul's earliest epistles to the church today. Wrongly dividing by over-dividing the Bible has become extremely divisive and must be cautiously avoided. Those who hyper-divide their Bibles are called hyper-dispensationalists. We will point out more specifics concerning their errors along with their erroneous outcomes later. With the foundation now firmly established, let us go on to perfection. In other words, let us consider some specific teachings and how to properly apply that which we have learned. God being our helper, we will learn how to walk and establish ourselves in the perfect will of God. This is the end of chapter 20. Chapter 21, Rightly Dividing Paul. Before proceeding, it is imperative to first address the onslaught of false doctrine that has resulted from over-application of the principle about to be introduced. Unfortunately, far too many teachers take the truth of God and pervert it into a lie, 2 Corinthians 2.17. They push their unscriptural system of so-called right division to an extreme, leaving Christians with only a few epistles to study, trust, and implement in the present age. God never intended for Christians to hyperdivide the Bible, making so much of it inapplicable today. These particular type of Bible teachers claim that Paul's earliest epistles, basically his missionary epistles, have very little bearing upon the church today because Paul did not understand the, quote, mystery of the one body until after he landed in prison, wrote the book of Ephesians. Footnote number one. Because Romans 16, 25 through 27, a missionary epistle, shows that Paul had received the 
Revelation of the Mystery, Ethelbert William E. W. Bullinger, a hyper-dispensationalist of the worst sort, states that Paul added a postscript to Romans with these verses added in chapter 16 after arriving in Rome. This philosophy of teaching has done much damage by forcing the Bible to conform to a man-made system of teaching and formulas. This teaching is easy to refute, making it difficult to understand how these teachers gain a following. This is especially true when verses like the following in Paul's missionary epistles completely contradict any such notion. Romans 12.4, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Paul certainly understood the mystery concerning the body of Christ while on his missionary journeys and prior to writing his prison epistles. Yet these false teachers present their students with a unique form of worship enabling them to gather to themselves a following. These same teachers generally can be spotted by their treatment of things like the local church ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. This form of hyper-dispensationalism should be avoided because it is dangerous, divisive, and destructive. Again, keep in mind that Christians are commanded to rightly divide the Bible, and if the Bible can be rightly divided, it can be wrongly divided. Rightly dividing the word of truth in its simplest form means understanding the Bible within its intended context. The Bible student should understand the time and circumstances of various passages within the Scripture and grasp how those variations affect the present application of any particular passage. As already stated, all Scripture is profitable. All of it is even profitable for doctrine, 2 Timothy 3.16. Page 308 has a chart titled, Spotting Hyper-Dispensationalism. Although some Bible teachers would cringe at being referred to as a hyper-dispensationalist, most believers are, in fact, dispensationalists. For instance, all those who claim distinctions between the Old and New Testaments are rightly dividing the word of truth. However, far too many Bible teachers commit one or more errors as it pertains to proper study and understanding of the Scriptures. They create a system of division that falls short of God's intended method of Bible study, or they create a system of division that goes beyond God's intended method. To help visualize where one might fit in this equation, consider how you would answer the following four questions. Number one, is anything that Matthew, Mark, or Luke wrote applicable and binding upon Christians today during the church age? Number two, is anything that John wrote applicable and binding upon Christians during the church age? Number three, is anything that Peter and James wrote applicable and binding upon Christians during the church age? Number four, is anything that Paul wrote not applicable and binding upon Christians today during the church age? Hopefully most Christians would readily accept the fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter and James, wrote truths binding and applicable upon the church today. Yet far too many students cannot imagine how Paul, the apostle of Gentiles, could have written some truths that are non-binding upon Christians in the church today. Yet, he did write some things that were both time-sensitive and audience-related. Do not dismiss that last thought. Churches should not try to incorporate everything the apostle of the Gentiles wrote simply because he wrote it. As previously stated, Paul's epistles are divided into three subsections. Number one, missionary epistles. Number two, prison epistles. And number three, closing epistles. Within these three divisions, there exist shifts in ministry and focus directly impacting one's practice today. As a starting point, we must establish some proof texts concerning when the books were written. The timing of the book of Romans offers a good starting point and precedent. In Paul's epistles to the Romans, he stated that he was praying about making a journey to Rome, Romans 1.10 making a request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. A few verses later, Paul mentions that Rome was a Gentile enclave. 
This clues the reader into why God did not direct him to this predominant Gentile land until later in his ministry. He first had to preach to and reach the Jews, Romans 1.16. Romans 1.13 Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Throughout the book of Romans, we are reminded that Paul's intended travels to Rome were hindered. Additionally, we receive confirmation in the final chapter of Romans that this book was written during Paul's missionary journeys prior to his arrival in Rome in Acts chapter 28. Tracing his travels to Rome also reinforces the fact that Paul did not write Hebrews from Italy early in his ministry before receiving the revelation of the mystery. Romans 15.22 For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. Since Paul traveled to Rome for the first time in Acts chapter 28, the timing of the book of Romans must be during his missionary journeys and prior to Acts chapter 28. Obviously, Paul intended to travel to Rome, but God never opened the door during his missionary journeys. Clearly, God did not want him to leave the areas primarily populated by Jews until his purpose and plan for them was realized. Because of the transitional nature of some teachings, it is important to grasp the timing and specific application of Paul's writings. In many ways, the New Testament church can be associated to the life and growth of an individual. Things done in childhood may not continue to be done as the individual ages. This is true of the church's development. As such, some noteworthy elements during the church's infancy are no longer practiced by the church in its maturation. Paul indicated as much when he contrasted changes that take place moving from childhood to adulthood. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. This transition reflected by a maturation process becomes clear when one compares the content and nature of certain epistles and Paul's missionary epistles with the content and nature of his prison and final epistles. Tracing Paul's Steps Paul's epistles contain internal hints that reveal the timing and location of the authorship of each epistle. Pinpointing where and when Paul's epistles were written allows the Bible student to get a more complete understanding of the order and distinctions found within them. Assuredly, God always provides the workman sufficient evidence when the necessary time is invested. For instance, only Paul's epistles close with what is commonly called a postscript, found after the last verse in the epistle. Each postscript provides pertinent information, such as the location from where the epistle was sent. This noteworthy external information, along with the epistle's actual contents, helps to understand the general circumstances prevalent at the time of the writing of the epistles. On page 311, the chart is titled, Paul's Missionary Epistles. A basic timeline of the events involving the Apostle Paul offers a proper perspective. It is generally agreed that the Apostle Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 occurred just a few years following the Lord's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Approximately a decade after Christ's ascension into heaven, Paul commenced upon his first of three missionary journeys, Acts chapter 13. Nearly a decade after the first missionary endeavor, the Apostle Paul took his second missionary journey, Acts chapter 15. During this second missionary journey, Paul wrote the two epistles to the Corinthians. Either in Acts chapter 16 or Acts chapter 18, both epistles to the Thessalonians, Acts chapter 17, and the epistle to the Romans, Acts chapter 18. With this internal biblical proof, we have identified these epistles as well as epistles written to the Galatians sent from Italy as his missionary epistles. We will discuss the timing of Galatians later. Understanding the circumstances leading up to and continuing during this period is imperative. The Old Testament scriptures focus primarily upon the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Following the Old Testament canon, the 400 years of silence left the nation with no vision, Proverbs 29:18. The arrival of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, brought a great hope to those Jewish people who were in search of truth. Yet even with the arrival of the Son of God, the Jews struggled to relinquish their old covenant and old practices. The emphasis and focus upon the Jewish people continued after the ministry of Christ and into Paul's ministry, Jew first, Romans 1.16. The Gentiles did not become the primary focus until after Paul's salvation called a ministry. 
And even then, it was a gradual transition. In fact, God's emphasis upon the Jews did not cease after Paul's earliest journeys and letters. For this reason and others, it is important that the Bible student take note of the transitional elements reflected in Paul's epistles. Such transitions are most evident when his early epistles are compared to those he wrote once in prison in Rome. As the book of Acts chronicles Paul's journeys, the transitions become more apparent. Thus noting where and when Paul penned his epistles proves most insightful because his ministry exhibited demonstrable variations. For example, when during Paul's ministry were signs and wonders most prominent? When during his epistles was the emphasis upon the Jewish people most prominent? Do Paul's writings between his earlier and latter epistles demonstrate variations which some people view as contradictory? Paul's missionary journeys were interrupted because of his imprisonment by Rome. He was ultimately led to Rome as a prisoner where he would be held in captivity. Acts chapter 28 records Paul's arrival in Rome. It was from Rome that he wrote seven of his epistles at various times. Even here, the circumstances varied from epistle to epistle. For example, Paul likely started or even finished his letter to the Galatians prior to his imprisonment, no mention of bonds, but the epistle was sent to Galatia once Paul's ship reached Rome in Acts chapter 28. Additionally, the epistles of Paul to the saints at Ephesus, Philippi, and Colossae, along with his letter to Philemon, were all written from Rome. These are all considered prison epistles because of the specific emphasis upon Paul's bonds. Footnote number two. All the major commentaries posit an early date for the writing of Galatians, but all the commentators have been wrong before. The postscript found after the last verse of Galatians reads, under the Galatians written from Rome. This postscript would negate an early date prior to Acts chapter 28 for Galatians. We know that the authorized version, 1611, included this postscript, as did earlier editions like the Bishop's Bible and the Geneva Bible. It can also be found in Erasmus' first Greek edition. Lastly, the textual evidence shows that many manuscripts contained the subject postscript. On page 313, the chart is titled, Paul's Missionary versus Prison Epistles. Upon careful examination, Paul's remaining epistles were written either between two distinct imprisonments or during his final imprisonment. For example, Paul wrote to Titus from Nicopolis of Macedonia and began the epistle with a reminder to Titus concerning why he left Titus in Crete. See Titus 1.5, Acts 27.12. This correspondence to Titus took place after Paul's initial Roman imprisonment which is confirmed by no mention of Paul's bonds in the epistle to Titus. Also, during this final journey, Paul visited Laodicea, where he penned an epistle to his son in the faith, Timothy. Sometime after the first epistle to Timothy was written, Paul traveled through Miletum, where an illness forced Paul to leave Trophimus behind sick. 2 Timothy 4.20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Finally, Paul returned to Rome, likely with Timothy, where he was again imprisoned. According to the postscript in the book of Hebrews, Paul wrote that book from Italy, and within the epistle, he mentioned that he either was or had been imprisoned, hoped to visit the recipients, a visit that likely never took place. By all accounts, Paul's epistle written to Timothy was his final epistle from Rome, again mentioning bonds where the postscript says written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. The Bible is surely an amazing book where even the oft-overlooked postscripts at the end of Paul's epistles offer light to supersede man's mere conjecture. The transitions that took place during Paul's ministry are significant and quite enlightening. From the time that Paul penned his first epistles to the time he penned his final epistle to Timothy, likely only a little over a decade had passed between Paul's first and his last epistle, but the differences are profound. In fact, much false doctrine can be avoided simply by considering the transition within Paul's ministry. God simply does not spoon-feed Bible knowledge. He wants Christians to show themselves approved as workmen. You are to study to show yourself approved, and in doing so, you could avoid being unnecessarily ashamed. 2 Timothy 2.15 God places necessary clues for Bible study within the Bible itself. 
For instance, Paul's mentioning of being a prisoner or of being in bonds and chains affirms the fact that he wrote these epistles during his imprisonment. The first of the prison epistles, the book of Ephesians, contains three passages which emphasize Paul's imprisonment. But it is not the only one with these clues. Initial Roman imprisonment, Ephesians 3.1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Ephesians 4.1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Ephesians 6.20 for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Philippians 1, seven. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. Philippians 1.13, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. Colossians 4, 3, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Colossians 4, 18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you, amen. Philemon 9, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Later Roman imprisonment. 2 Timothy 1.16, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. 2 Timothy 2.9, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Hebrews 10.34, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Hebrews 13.3, Remember them that are in bonds is bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Each of the preceding verses makes reference to one of Paul's imprisonments. All of these verses are found in Paul's non-missionary epistles. Recognizing the division is very important and becomes critical when one attempts to answer the cults and those churches propagating false doctrine. The chart on page 316 is titled, Paul's freedom versus bondage. To the Jew first. Failure to understand the transitions within Paul's epistles has produced some of the most unnecessary divisions within God's body of believers. Some of the divisiveness borders on heresy, but a larger portion of that which divides us is avoidable through a little grace and learning. One specific transition that has brought about a division amongst the ranks of Bible-believing Christians involves a specific practice in evangelistic outreach. Have you ever wondered how history moved from Jesus testifying, I am not sent but on the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24, to Paul testifying, the salvation of God is sent of the Gentiles and they will hear it, Acts 28, 28. One might say that it was merely a difference in the ministries of Christ and Paul. While in a general sense this could be true, that answer is far too simplistic. The reality is that several transitions took place between these statements made by Jesus and made by Paul. During the ministry of Christ, the Lord plainly declared to his Jewish disciples that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. When sending out his Jewish disciples, Christ told them to go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10, 6. However, toward the end of Christ's earthly ministry, he broadened the scope of the outreach. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, Matthew 28, 19, followed by, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1, 8. Be sure not to miss how the directives evolved even during Christ's earthly ministry prior to Paul's conversion or writings. Paul's ministry also opened with phrases concerning outreach indicating Jewish prominence. For instance, Paul expressed his lack of shame for the gospel of Christ and declared that the gospel of Christ was to the Jew first. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's actions confirmed what he had written. We must merely trace his path through the book of Acts as he traveled from place to place, preaching first in the synagogues. Acts 9.20, Acts 13.5, 
Acts 15.41, Acts 14.1, Acts 17.1.10.17, Acts 18.4 and 19, Acts 19.8.9. The final recorded stop, Acts 19 verses 8 and 9, occurred during the early part of Paul's third missionary journey. All the other mentions of his going into the synagogue occurred either immediately following his conversion to Christ or during his first and second missionary journeys. This transition is quite significant. While on his missionary journeys, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, and the believers in Rome. Quite significantly, in Paul's epistle to the Romans, he spoke frequently and often glowingly about the Jewish people. Paul claimed that both the presentation of the gospel, Romans 1.16, and the condemnation and blessing were to the Jew first. Romans 2.9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. He also wrote repeatedly of the advantage held by the Jews. Romans 3.1, what advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Romans 9, 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises? Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all? God bless it forever. Amen. He continued by expressing his heartfelt desire to see Israel saved. Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Almost the entire next chapter in Romans declared God's promise to restore Israel to prominence in the future. Romans 11, verses 1 through 32. Additionally, in his epistle to the Corinthian believers, Paul revealed that unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. 1 Corinthians 9, 20. Paul wrote these sentiments of becoming as a Jew, although he himself was born a Jew. Even in Paul's early epistles, he made it known that God was opening the door to the Gentiles and that there was truly no difference between Jew and Gentile in Christ. Yet Paul's ministry began with a Jew first mentality and gradually shifted as he fulfilled his calling to first preach the gospel of Christ to his kinsmen. The seeds of this transition can be clearly seen in the book of Acts. On three separate occasions, the Apostle Paul expressed his turn in direction of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 13 and 18 and 28. Acts 13, 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Acts 18, 6, And when they opposed themselves in blasphemy, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean, from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Acts 28, 28, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. On page 319, the chart is titled Acts Turning Points. Without understanding Paul's shift in ministry focus, some well-meaning missionaries and preachers teach that all Christians today must first reach Jews before tackling any outreach to the Gentiles. We should certainly rejoice that Jewish missionaries are ministering in one of the most difficult mission fields in the world, but their burden does not take precedence over the other mission efforts. Any misappropriation and misapplication of Scripture out of God's intended context is always wrong, no matter how well-meaning the motives. As much as we respect anyone desiring to minister the gospel of Christ to any people group, we must not allow our love for the Jews to skew what is biblically right and proper. According to the Apostle Paul, our understanding of the matter at hand will be increased by considering what he said, 2 Timothy 2.7. Not only should we consider what Paul said as a means of greater understanding, but we should also consider what he did. At the time of Paul's writings of the epistle to the Romans, there were strong Jewish population centers, Romans 11.5. As such, God commissioned Paul to first present the gospel to the Jewish people, Romans 1.16. This truth is confirmed by Paul's personal testimony in the book of Acts when he said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, Acts 13, 46. Once the Jews rejected the message, seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, see Acts 13, 46. 
Paul turned to the Gentiles in each of the geographic regions where he ministered. In any given region, once the Jews were presented the gospel, Jews and Gentiles were treated alike. Lastly, as a prisoner of Rome, Paul expressed that the gospel had spread in all the world, Colossians 1, 5, and 6. In other words, the gospel message had been preached to both Jew and Gentile in all the world, fulfilling God's directive. Consequently, after these initial evangelistic missions, the Jews' advantage of being presented the gospel first no longer had any doctrinal bearing upon the church's outreach efforts. The Word of God demonstrates this transition in several parallel circumstances as the Jewish outreach emphasis diminished. Far too many Christians recognized that the people at the time of Paul's missionary journeys possessed very little New Testament scripture, if any. Some of the audience may have had knowledge of the Old Testament and others the ministry of Christ, yet they lacked the scripture to confirm any such knowledge. This is the reason why God gave the apostles signs, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, and wonders as they went forth preaching the word to confirm their heaven-sent message to the Jewish people, Mark sixteen twenty, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, amen. This practice, starting with Christ, continued into Paul's missionary journeys. This is especially true as it pertained to Paul's Jewish outreach, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. The Israelites had come to expect this treatment throughout much of the Old Testament because signs frequently accompanied God's message to them. One of the sign gifts used by God during this period was the supernatural gift of tongues. Tongues were expressly performed for a sign to overcome the Jews' unwillingness to accept God's spokesman. 1 Corinthians 14.22 Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. The signs followed the Apostle Paul through his missionary journeys. However, they did not continue to the end of his ministry, nor did they continue with anyone beyond the first century. While God offered the gospel to the Jew first, these signs served as a confirmation of the message being preached. This combination of ministering to the Jews first and the accompanying signs can be traced throughout the book of Acts, even as they were diminishing. Two circumstances changed, modifying Paul's ministry and the propagation of the gospel going forward in the rest of the church age. Number one, the passing of time, and two, the westward movement of the gospel. The further away the apostles and those taught by the apostles spread out from Jerusalem, and the farther from the inception of the church, the less the Jews were given prominence. Less prominence meant less sign gifts, including tongues. In fact, a Christian has only three options when considering the Jew first principle of Romans 1.16. Number one, decide that the verse is to be taken literally as a binding practice upon believers throughout the church age or two, determine that these instructions were literal, but time and location sensitive, or three, ignore any potential application of the verse altogether by pretending that the scripture does not mean what it says. These sign gifts confirming the word simply demonstrate God's merciful and gracious character toward his chosen people. The command of Romans 1.16 was time sensitive as God gradually transitioned from a 2,000 year period of Jewish prominence beginning with Abram in Genesis chapter 12 to a time in which he would use Gentiles to fulfill his plan and purpose throughout the rest of the church age. Paul's actions confirm these truths. Following his conversion, see Acts chapter 9, Paul immediately obeyed the command of Romans 1.16 by preaching Jesus to the Jews in the synagogues. Acts 9.20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Why preach in the synagogues? The reason is quite simple. There was no better place to find the largest gathering of Jews in need of the gospel than in their places of worship. Paul testified to King Agrippa that he went to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Acts 26.19 Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. The Apostle Paul's travels throughout the book of Acts reveal that he was obedient to this principle. Yet it is equally important to note that all of this pointed to a God-ordained transitioning. God knew the difficulties facing the Jews. They expected the customary signs as proof of God speaking. If God abruptly ended Jewish prominence during the early church without the confirming signs, the Jews would have had no confirmation of God's blessing upon the messages that were being spoken. The historical record in the book of Acts reveals that a major shift took place in Acts chapter 19. This is easily seen 
Acts chapter 19 records the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey and shows several proofs that the pattern had changed. First, it records the last time that Paul preached or taught in a synagogue. Additionally, that chapter describes the first of two remaining events. There were miracles done by the hands of Paul, impacting those to whom he ministered. Acts 19.11 And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Only in Acts chapter 28, just prior to Paul's prison epistles, do we find another event where miracles were performed. Paralleling the truths above, Acts chapter 19 is coincidentally, quote unquote, also the last chapter where men spake with tongues. Acts 19, 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, they spake with tongues and prophesied. This is most assuredly by God's design. After Paul arrived in Rome, he released his epistle to the Galatians. Later, he wrote his epistles to Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Philemon. Not one time in any of the prison epistles or final epistles did Paul speak of healing tongues or ministering to the Jews first. Why is that? Paul was no longer going to the Jew first. The gift of tongues had ceased, as Paul prophesied they would in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. And healing as an apostolic gift was phased out or, at the very least, had greatly diminished in importance. Paul went from healing people with handkerchiefs or aprons from his body to the following three things. Number one, to watching a fellow servant nearly die. Philippians 2, 7, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Number two, to giving medical advice for healing. 1 Timothy 5.23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Number three, to having to leave behind a dear brother too sick to continue in the ministry. 2 Timothy 4.20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. The chart on page 323 is titled, Signs Transitioning. Why does all this matter? Unfortunately, the average Christian has no desire to learn all these distinctions and details. It takes too much time, effort, and attention to decipher the truths set forth. And yet God said men must be workmen, willing to study to show themselves approved. Why does any of this matter? The fact is that truth always matters. In fact, God put these truths in his word and expects us to work to find them. People are confused because they do not care enough to dig and to search the scriptures until they are assured of knowing the truth. Understanding that one must rightly divide, even within the epistles of Paul, will clarify some conundrums faced by the present generation led by the televangelists with their lavish homes and jet-set lifestyles. Rightly dividing helps explain why Paul said, I suppose, therefore, this is good for the present distress, and it continues, for a man so to be, that is unmarried in the context, 1 Corinthians 7, 26, and later warned that forbidding to marry was a doctrine of devils, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. It might help one to understand why Paul had Timothy circumcised, Acts 16, 1 through 3, and yet declared that true circumcision was that of the heart, Romans 2, 29. It might shed light on why Paul would say, If meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, 1 Corinthians 8, 13, and yet later warned against those who commanded to abstain from meats, 1 Timothy 4, 3. Of these truths is contradictory unless the individual ignores proper Bible study. Instead, they demonstrate a progression in revelation and a change in time, circumstances, and people groups. The Jews needed to be reached, and the door of opportunity was quickly closing. During this open door, if a man was unmarried, he was not to seek a wife, 1 Corinthians 7, 27. Instead, he was to give himself unreservedly to the ministry at hand. At this time, a man might allow himself to be circumcised, a testimony to Jews, although he knew circumcision no longer had any relevance in his obedience toward God. He might even avoid certain things offered to idols because of the offense it would cause the Jews. Paul completely absorbed himself in the work, making everyone aware of their responsibility to reach the Jews. Paul conveyed a sense of urgency, pointing out that the time is short and even calling it 
the present distress. First Corinthians seven twenty nine. But this I say unto you, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. First Corinthians seven twenty six. I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. After all, the supernatural signs and advantages enjoyed by the Jews were quickly waning. God gave signs and wonders, including tongues and apostolic healing, to enable the Jews to accept the preaching of the gospel. Paul knew the signs were ending and would soon be eliminated altogether. When that happened, it would become much more difficult for the Jews to accept the legitimacy of the gospel. Time was truly short. The transition record. When was the transition complete? The book of Acts offers the answer to this critically important question. By reading and studying Paul's journeys recorded in the book of Acts, one can easily determine God's blueprint. The purpose of each of the missionary journeys was to reach the Jews before God allowed the supernatural signs and wonders to cease. Once the Jews were reached in any geographic location, God turned Paul's primary focus to the Gentiles. As discussed earlier, there are three statements indicating turning points away from the Jews and an increased emphasis upon the Gentiles. Acts chapter 13 contains the first of these three turning points and shows the turning point in Asia Minor. Acts 13, 44, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. The final chapter of the book of Acts records the third and final statement of transition. This time Paul gathered the chief of the Jews together in Rome and preached to them Acts 28:17. When the Jews rejected the gospel, the apostle made his final statement of turning and his prophetic pronouncement concerning the Gentiles' willingness to hear. Acts 28, 26, saying, Go unto this people, that always refers to Israel, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Although each instance bears some unique characteristics, a pattern manifests itself among the three. Each narrative records Paul's pointing to the necessity of God's word being preached to the Jews first, and the writer of Acts pointing to their rejection and blasphemy, Mark 3.29. Patterns demonstrate the following five points. Each of the three turning points consists of most or all of these five elements. Number one, Paul arrived in a new city. Number two, he entered the Jewish place of worship. Number three, this took place on the Jewish Sabbath day. Number four, some Jews rejected the word and blasphemed God. Number five, God turned from the Jews to the Gentiles in this geographic location and led Paul to turn his focus to the Gentiles. In the end, the transitional examples set forth in this chapter barely touch the surface of the matter. However, enough insight is available to enable the reader to grasp the truth. Some of the transitions are, at present, unknown to the authors of this work. The Bible is a living book and offers continual light, joy, and knowledge. It is each man's responsibility to mine for the truth through diligent study. Maybe God will use you to disclose more of these yet-to-be-discovered transitional elements. That is the end of chapter 21.